reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you will not serve my God or worship the golden statue that I set up? Be ready now to fall down and worship the statue I may, had made. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, flute, lyre, harp, psaltery, bagpipe, and all the other musical instruments, otherwise you shall be instantly cast into the white hot furnace. And who is the God who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, there is no need for us to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, can save us from the white hot furnace, and from your hands, O king, may he save us. But even if he will not, know, O king, that we will not serve your God or worship the golden statue that you set up. King Nebuchadnezzar's face became livid with utter rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than usual, and had some of the strongest men in his army bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the white hot furnace. Nebuchadnezzar rose in haste and asked his nobles, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Assuredly, O king, they answered. But he replied, I see four men unfettered and unhurt, walking in the fire, and the fourth looks like a son of God. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to deliver the servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the royal command and yielded their bodies rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Verbum Domini. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our fathers, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. And blessed is your holy and glorious name, praiseworthy and exalted above all for all ages. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you in the temple of your holy glory, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed are you on the throne of your kingdom, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you who look into the depths from your throne upon the cherubim, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Glory and praise forever. Blessed are you in the firmament of heaven, praiseworthy and glorious forever.
Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioanem. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if the son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no room among you. I tell you what I have seen in the Father's presence. Then do what you have heard from the Father. They answered and said to him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. Verbum Domini. This gospel stops here at verse 42. But the next verses are also part of the same conversation and brings it to a certain kind of bookends. I'm not sure why the people in charge of the lectionary stopped at this point. But in John chapter 8, beginning with verse 43 and 44, he goes on to explain to them that you do not know my words because you are not able to hear my word. You are from your father, the de you are from uh, the father, or your father is the devil, and that the desires of your father you want to do. And it goes on to explain that there are two characteristics of the devil, namely that he is a murderer, a liar, and the father of lies. And it's important for us to see this contrast. At the beginning of the gospel, our Lord says, if you remain in my words, and of course my words remain in you, you will be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. A lot of times I've heard in popular media that when somebody is telling another person a certain truth, they'll quote that part of this verse and say that the truth will set you free. Usually it is, I caught you doing something bad and now I know the truth that you were up to and that'll set you free. That's not what it's about. That's a misuse of the text. It's about 
the words of Christ living within us and us living within those words so that we become disciples. The process of conversion is a lifelong process of ongoing discipleship. We are constantly finding that God's word corrects us. That's one of the reasons that we need to have this season of Lent every year throughout our lives into adulthood. The temptations may change. The temptations of the younger stages of life are not the temptations of the older stages of life. And as we get older, we get more cranky. And that's the way that it is. And so we, the, we cranky older folks have to learn not to be cranky. Along with lots of other things, there's a strong temptation to avarice as we get older because we're afraid that we'll be impoverished and, and hungry and lots of, lots of other things that occur in old age. The temptations of the younger stages of life are usually different usually more in the focus on pleasure. A lot of times when you get old, you forget why you wanted the pleasure. So this is something that changes. But at each step of the way, there are temptations. Maturity doesn't mean that you get rid of all temptation. It just change. And they follow us at every angle. And so we must be disciples of Christ who constantly allow him to teach us his word so that at every stage of the word of our lives that word of Christ remains within us and we remain within that word and this is in some ways all the more true because being a senior citizen I can remember the 1960s and one of the strong temptations in that period within the church was that many people were taken by the development of the social sciences, sociology, social work, psychology, which are useful tools in their way. But all too often, the word of Christ was judged as to whether or not it fit what modern psychology might say. Precisely at the time when modern psychology in the 60s and 70s was going from one fad to another. And that meant jumping from fad to fad and you kept on changing your norms for judging the word. It's just the opposite. The word of Christ is the basis upon which we judge the truth or falsity of these other things. But all too easily, people would say, well, in the modern times, we have this new insight, and so we are way beyond that. This is not what we are to go to. It ends up with people losing faith. And the more that any church followed that norm and followed the norms of secular society, the fewer people went to that church. I can remember how many people would say, if we would just go along with society, people would flock to us. It's just the opposite. If we don't proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, they walk as well they should, as well they should. The word of Christ is what gives us the truth and freedom. And the other thing that we see that comes more from philosophy than the social sciences, going back to the early 1700s, people, people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who really is one of the early thinkers of modernity, an early modern thinker, really believed and gave a temptation. He, well, I would say he fell for a temptation that exists through time. 
The temptation is, look, the church, the state, the, your parents, these people around you are imposing rules and regulations just so they can keep you under their control. And you need to be free of those rules and try this drug, enter this sexual relationship, be unfaithful to your spouse. Look, just take this stuff. You, you know, these people are capitalists who have too much anyway. Just take their stuff or destroy it. They don't deserve to have it and so on. And the temptation to be free of the rules and regulations is very frequent perhaps even going back to the serpent. And the reason that that's important is such people who try to introduce others to drugs don't highlight the fact that it is addictive. Alcohol is addictive and will kill you if you become addicted. Not the first drink, not even the first time you get drunk usually but the addiction slowly kills you. The addiction to the drugs kills your soul and then your body. The addiction to pornography kills your ability to love real people and images that are fake control your mind and dominate you and yet keep you coming back so that we see a pandemic of these addictions. And pay attention to the way many people in our government, on our political parties, not just one, but both, they want us to have freedom, as they call it, to have a lot of pleasures, especially now as they legalize some drugs. Stay high and just relax, or as they make sexual expression something that you should do in any way, just so long as you don't end up with a baby, because the overpopulation is the biggest problem we have in the world. So have as much sexual experience as you want, but just don't have any babies. And they promote all kinds of sexuality by which children cannot be there. And if there's an accident and a child is there, it's just a blob of cells. And so just take care of it. And in places like Moscow and New York and Washington, D.C., 60% of all children conceived are aborted. Those three cities, probably some others. And this is something where folks don't let us know that there's an enslavement. And of course they don't let us know. Why? Because the sinfulness goes back to those verses that I wanted to include for today's gospel. Satan is a liar. He will not tell the truth about sin. He will not let you know of the addictive quality. He will not let people know that it's deadly. He won't say that. And it'll be the evil one who wants to use death as his ally. Notice how the prophet Isaiah said in the Old Testament, do not make an alliance with death. And later on in the book of wisdom, chapter one, it speaks about how it's Satan who brings death into the world. This saying of our Lord Jesus goes back to that. And think about the way politicians are children of Satan in the way that they use death as their ally and call the murder of the sick mercy. Who but Satan would associate mercy with murder? Of course, he's the father of murders and sees mercy as killing.
And the same, of course, with aborting children. And with killing people, we see not only that permission is given to kill the elderly and the unborn, but now we see people say, well, I don't like Asians, so I'm going to push them in front of subways. I don't like these other people, and I'll beat them to death. We see this increase of violence throughout society. People bringing guns around places they don't belong and using death as self-expression of anger. That is from the evil one. And this is where Christ, who calls himself the life and the resurrection, Christ, who calls himself the truth, his truth personified in John 14, 6. Here he's saying that if you let my words abide, abide in you, you will know truth. Truth is not just something abstract. It's something God desires to bestow. And think about the importance of the concept of truth, especially in the, concept, in the context of our society where truth is said to be relative. You have your truth, I have my truth. We'll just let each other exist. That means there is no such thing as truth in the minds of those who say it. And at the same time that you have people promoting that there's no truth, they become ever more controlling of what is allowed to be said. Try to say some things that dissent from the opinions on some of these social platforms in the, in the internet. You get canceled. Even if you have a scientific position, if it's not theirs, you get canceled. While they say truth is relative, only their truth can be seen. And it's oftentimes not in accordance with the facts of life. They want us to cancel the truth about Christ through their lies. And in that way, these people who push this cancel culture are also children of the devil, their father, the father of lies. This is something that our Lord is teaching us as he's also teaching us that he is God. We saw yesterday, he claims, I am. And when I'm lifted up on the cross, you will know that I am. In fact, it's no accident that it was the centurion who, as soon as Jesus died, said, truly, this one is the Son of God. This truth, this God who dies to give us his truth, wants us to be disciples formed in that truth, judging the world by his truth judging our own lives by his truth, judging the lives of the evil one by God's truth. And in this way, not only will we enter into eternal life with Christ, but by the grace that he bestows on so many in the world, he will bring them also to eternal life.